the sports. John Updike, for instance, with his great essay that came out a couple of days after Ted Williams' last game at Fenway, in which he hit a home run. That essay was called, it was on, I think it was in the Globe or the Herald, but it was called The Kid Bids Adieu to the Hub. The Kid, one of Williams' nicknames, you know? Uh, what we did was, what I did was, I, I wanted to give the sort of merge baseball together with America's history and look at them as one and the same. That the visions and the ideals that America has had since its inception is very much a part of the visions and the ideals of uh, baseball. That there are reasons why baseball, which is not our most populous sport, but there are reasons why it's seen as the national pastime. See, it doesn't even say sport, it says the national pastime. So it, it ties in with uh, just the rhythms and uh, the beauty of uh, the American experience. The distance from each base, base to the next one is 90 feet. Everything is built upon the mystical number three, a beginning, middle, and end. One, two, three, a beginning, middle, and end. A holy trinity, sanctity, holding the game to its spiritual vision. Until the introduction of the designated hitter in the American League, uh, only in 1973, a bad change in my opinion, in order to bat, one had to also play in the field. It was only fair. Everybody wants to bat, but you know, to, to pay your dues, to get up to bat, you've got to go out there with your glove and glove and do the best you can, like Frank Howard did in left field, <laughs> right? Not a very pretty fielder, but why could he hit home runs? So the manager, Gil Hodges at the time, managing the 1967 Washington Senators, man of big hands, Gil Hodges, I got his autograph so I saw how big they were. You know, he had to find a way to get Howard in the lineup. Like, like, like so many uh, American boys, you know, I was introduced to baseball in a very casual way by my father, just simply play and catch and him teaching me how to bat, you know, and you go through Little League and things like that. Like so many American boys, I certainly didn't have the talent to go any further than Little League, but I always enjoyed watching the game, following the game, looking at box scores. There was just something about uh, the, the power of baseball that struck me in a way that no other sports did. So anyway, I, I, yeah, I teach a, a course at Dean called The Literature of Baseball, and that comes from you know, my growing up and my following the game and again seeing something really unique in the design of the game, the rules of the game, the fact that the, the game could go on forever because it doesn't have a clock, timeless quality. But um, I saw it as a very literary uh, kind of sport and I found that there were a number of excellent books, novels, poems, plays about baseball. So I thought, why not? Why not have a literature course it's focused on the national pastime, a kind of an extension of American literature. And that's where literature of baseball, it's always very popular. You know, I always get a number of students who sign up for it. Unfortunately, some of them don't know that there's extensive reading and writing involved in the course, that, that we're not just gonna sit around and talk baseball. You know, that we, uh, a lot of writing and reading analysis. The wall. You know, uh, all of that. What would have been a home run in Yankee Stadium is a long single, if Ortiz bothers to run it out, off the left field wall at Fenway. And what would have been a towering pop-up in Yankee Stadium's left field is a game-winning three-run homer in Fenway Park in early October of 1978 off Mike Torres. Bucky friggin' debt would have been a pop out. Any other, what do they say? The wall giveth and the wall taketh away.